My name is Sam Jacob Chai. I'm a consultant cardiologist in York. Over the past three or four years, I've developed an interest in this condition called POTS, Postural Orthostatic Tachycardia Syndrome. And today I wanted to do a video talking about some of the lifestyle changes which can make a real difference in patients with POTS. The first thing to try and understand is what is POTS? POTS stands for Postural Orthostatic Tachycardia Syndrome, meaning that when patients stand up, they struggle. They don't like it and their heart rate goes up excessively high. They may feel dizzy and usually they prefer to then lie down or sit down. And one of the problems with that is that over a period of time, they do this more and more often and they become deconditioned. So because it is a condition that uh, it seems to be associated with posture, the, see, the way to try and address it has to be done by understanding what happens to us when we change posture. So I have a little um, accompaniment here which I can show, use to show you. So when we're lying down, ordinarily, if this was our body here uh, and the water in this bottle is the blood and this white thing is our brain. So when we're lying down, uh, the blood is getting to the brain. When we stand up, when we adopt an upright posture, what would happen is gravity would suck the blood down. And because gravity is sucking the blood down, the brain gets deprived of blood. And ordinarily what would happen would be that we would all collapse back. However, that doesn't happen. The reason it doesn't happen is because of two mechanisms or two reflexes that come into play. The first is that when we adopt an upright posture, our blood vessels in our legs squeeze. That is akin to me compressing the bottom of this to try and keep the, bottle, the blood reaching the brain. The second thing that happens is, remember, changing posture, standing up is a movement of arousal. Adrenaline is released, and the adrenaline will cause the heart rate to beat fast. So it's a bit like shaking the bottle. So you're squeezing and you're shaking, okay? You're squeezing and you're shaking, and that keeps the blood going to the brain. That's what happens normally. In patients with POTS, something around this, move, this mechanism, one of these mechanisms doesn't work as it should, and that is why they struggle. So in some people, what tends to happen is that the bottle, the, you cannot squeeze, so patients adopt an upright posture, but they cannot squeeze, their blood vessels cannot squeeze, and to try and compensate for that, the heart rate has to go up excessively fast, and that excessive surge in heart rate is very unsettling, uncomfortable for the patient, and pa the patient doesn't like it. In some people, however, the blood vessels do squeeze, but for some reason they just produce too much adrenaline and the heart rate goes up excessively, and that could be another mechanism by which patients struggle when they have POTS. So in terms of lifestyle modifications, the important things then from a lifestyle perspective are first to try and Fill the bottle up as much as you can. So the more blood in the body, the less likely you have to rely on these compensatory mechanisms. The second thing is obviously to encourage these blood vessels to squeeze. Okay, so to prevent this kind of pooling brought on by gravity, if you can encourage the blood vessels in some way to squeeze, then you push the, bottle, the blood up to the brain. Thirdly, of course, you want to try and avoid the heart rate going up excessively high. Why? Because one, it is very unsettling to get heart palpitations, the heart going very fast when you stand up. Two, the strength of a heartbeat is largely dependent on how much blood is pumped out of it, which is in turn largely dependent on how much blood is in the heart to pump out. When the heart rate goes up excessively high, the heart doesn't get enough time to fill with blood. So the heart is working harder, you're getting the fast heart rate, but you're not able to pump out as much blood as you should. That is the other problem. So trying to reduce the heart rate in some way can also help because if you slow the heart down, you get a more effective relaxation of the heart, more time for the heart to fill, and a more effective expulsion of blood. So in terms of lifestyle modifications, here are some lifestyle modifications I recommend to all my patients. The first thing is obviously fill the bottle up the best you can. Okay, And how do you fill the bottle up? You drink lots. The more water you drink, the more water you can retain, the better. So in general, I would recommend to all my patients that they drink at least three liters of water per day. If it's hot, when you need more water, 
drinking even more than that is a good thing. One of the problems a lot of patients, however, face is that the more water they drink, the more they just pass out. Uh, and that can be quite difficult. And in my next step, I'll tell you, talk to you about that. But drinking lots is really important. And remember, the first time when you get this is when you wake up first thing in the morning. So being able to drink a couple of glasses of water before you get out of bed first thing in the morning can work wonders. So it's well worth trying that. The second tip is to try and avoid excessive loss of fluid. Okay, so you're drinking all this fluid, but you don't want to lose the fluid. And therefore, it's a good idea to avoid those things that can cause us to lose fluid. Some patients get put on diuretics, you know, so if you lose the fluid, then uh, the POTS does get worse. In addition, there are natural diuretics, coffee, tea, uh, soda, and I would generally recommend patients avoid those things because that tends to have the uh, opposite impact of what we're trying to achieve. Number three, I think it is important to do those things that allow you to retain more fluid. So one thing is obviously taking in more fluid, but how do you stop just passing out that fluid? And the way you do that is by increasing your salt intake. So salt will retain water in the system and it's generally recommended that patients who have POTS increase their salt intake to 10 to 12 grams a day. How do you do that? Just by putting more salt on your food, but equally well, you can take these slow salt tablets. I also find that asking patients to take electrolyte tablets, tablets that you can buy in Boots or uh, in a health food store, which are not sugar rich, but uh, have all your vital electrolytes, your calcium and magnesium, your sodium, etc., is a good thing because that also helps retain more fluid in the system. So again, electrolytes are really important. Number five, I think magnesium supplementation can be really helpful. We know that 75% of the population is now deficient in magnesium and magnesium is hugely important in so many different ways to the heart. And so taking an additional magnesium supplement can help. It can help with sleep. It can help with anxiety. And a lot of my patients just generally feel better when they take a magnesium supplement. I think the only magnesium supplement I wouldn't recommend is magnesium oxide. The reason for not recommending it is that it is associated with a loose stomach, but also only 4% of what you take in gets uh, absorbed in your body, so the bioavailability is very low. But taking something like magnesium citrate, magnesium glycinate, magnesium taurate is exceptionally good. A lot of people ask me, well, my magnesium blood levels were normal, I wouldn't rely on the blood levels. They're notoriously unreliable. And the simple thing is just to take a magnesium supplement if you can. Of course, all this has to be checked by your own doctor as well. You know, I can just, I, I think it's always good to speak with your doctor about my recommendations to see if he agrees that they're right for you. I think it's also important to understand that patients can have nutritional deficiencies in addition to their POTS. Vitamin D deficiency is extremely common. Uh, many of my patients are iron deficient. They may have B12 or folate deficiency. So getting a whole battery of blood tests to look at all your vitamins, etc., is really important. And correcting them is really important. In particular, in women, I would say correction of vitamin D and correction of iron is really important. Some men can be testosterone deficient. And if you're testosterone deficient, it does impact on our sleep patterns. Because we don't sleep properly, that makes our POTS worse. In men, I would thoroughly recommend getting your vitamin D and testosterone levels checked and corrected if possible. Food is really important. I think it's important to understand that patients uh, who have POTS can get this thing called splanchnic pooling. So if you have a very big meal, blood can pool around the, the blood around the, in the blood vessels around the stomach, and that can make things worse. Again, it's the same thing as having pooling down here. You want all this blood to be getting around to the brain and people can feel worse. The way you counteract that is by trying to avoid big meals. You take small, regular meals, protein-rich meals, and you would want to take about six small meals a day. You would want to avoid any big meals and particularly big meals before you go to bed at night. And ideally, if you can do a little bit of something, some kind of movement, exercise, etc., that's a good thing. But avoiding um, big meals for at least four hours before you to go to bed is, is really helpful. I think it's uh, important, of course, to abstain from anything that is a stimulant. You know, one of the problems with POTS is that people have exaggerated responses to adrenaline. So you want to minimize these adrenaline surges. 
So avoidance of smoking, avoidance of stimulants, that's all really important. One of the really useful things to do in POTS is to obviously encourage the blood vessels to squeeze. Now one can do that from mechanical compression. So compression stockings can help squeeze this blood to the brain, okay? And uh, so compression stockings, the ones that seem to work are the ones that go to above the waist. They exert 30 to 40 millimeters of inward pressure. They can be prescribed by, the, by your GP. There is some information about how you prescribe for them on the POTS UK website. You have to be measured out for them because you want them to do what they do. And so you have to be measured out for them. Now, a lot of people have written to me and said, well, where do I get measured out from them? The best place to get measured out for them is a lymphedema clinic. So if you can find a local lymphedema clinic, they can really measure you out accurately and get you in touch with the right people who will give you the right compression stockings. I think paying attention to sleep is hugely important in POTS and I think sleep does tend to get neglected. There is no doubt that patients with POTS do not wake up feeling refreshed. I don't have a single patient with POTS who says that they wake up feeling refreshed. And this is one of the things that triggers off this idea that they may have POTS to me. I ask them, do you wake up feeling refreshed? And virtually everyone says, my sleep is horrendous. And the problem with that is that not only does it have an impact on our quality of life, but it also makes the POTS worse. There are lots of ways to try and improve our sleep quality. The first thing I would say is to try and pay really close attention to good sleep hygiene. Anything that causes an adrenaline surge just before you go to bed, will, the adrenaline will stay in your system and that will stop you from sleeping. And therefore it's a good idea to get into a nice calming ritual just before you go to bed, try and avoid any um, emotional conversations, uh, you know, upsetting phone calls, uh, watching anything upsetting. I think it's important to try and uh, get away from mobile phones and blue light and computer screens before you go to bed. Because again, you need the system to calm down. You need all the adrenaline in the system to calm down to allow you to go to sleep. During sleep, anything that causes an adrenaline surge is likely to wake a patient with POTS up and they are not uncommonly do patients say to me, oh, and I sometimes I wake up and my heart is beating really fast. The reason the heart is beating really fast is because they've had an adrenaline surge. Why have they had an adrenaline surge? Because a dog has barked or someone's made a noise or the phone has gone off or something like that. So minimizing adrenaline surges, paying attention to that can really improve the quality of sleep. Other things that can help with sleep are melatonin. So melatonin supplementation can help with sleep. Sometimes the administration of a small dose of beta blocker because beta blocker counteracts adrenaline can be helpful. So going to sleep, taking a small dose of beta blocker can allow people to have a more restful sleep. I don't really recommend uh, sleeping tablets for a couple of reasons. The first is that they're addictive. The second thing is that although they can help you get to sleep, they don't keep you asleep and you are still vulnerable to these adrenaline surges. So just sort of lifestyle measures, playing, paying good attention to your sleep is probably better than taking sleeping tablets, which come with their own problems. Many patients with POTS fall into this vicious cycle where they're not sleeping well, they're fatigued, the fatigue uh, can cause depression, depression causes pain, pain causes lack of sleep. So they get into this horrendous vicious cycle and a lot of patients end up becoming socially isolated just because they can't do things, they don't mix with their friends, they don't go out and it all gets overwhelming and psychologically it's very troubling. If you add uh, the stresses of day-to-day -day living, looking after kids, that's hard enough. The stresses of your employer not being able to understand and worrying about whether you'll still be in a job is really worrying. The stress of having a doctor not believing you, which a lot of patients with POTS have to endure, uh, is terrible. So in a lot of patients with POTS, I would always recommend, you know, psychological kind of input, going and speaking with someone just going and talking to someone, helping and, and surrounding yourself with a support network. You know, that would include a caring doctor, uh, caring relatives, friends, uh, having your employer on your side. And certainly in my own experience, when I see patients with POTS, I would often do them a letter. You know, I write them a letter, say to, you know, you're someone to their employer to say, look, you know, so this patient does have this condition, which is poorly understood, but it is a horrendously debilitating condition. 
but they're very capable of doing things and therefore provided you can make adjustments in their sort of working atmosphere, working environment, they can do the job without risking their health getting worse. And a lot of people have found that to be helpful. For students, it can be really helpful for them to have letters to take to their universities to say, look, you know, this person can get brain fog, the brain fog can be unpredictable, it can go on for days. And unfortunately, if they're doing a timed exam and they have a brain fog episode during that, that can not really give an accurate assessment of their capabilities. So maybe coursework based assessments are a better way to assess this person. And a lot of patients have found that to be particularly useful. Finally, there's exercise. And exercise is a bit of a double-edged sword. You don't want to put a person through too much exercise. You don't want them to push through exercise because that can actually make their POTS worse. At the same time, you don't want the patient to be deconditioned. However, a very careful, supervised training program can be helpful. There have been some studies where people have recommended a technique or a training program called the Levine training program. And this was a very, very gradual, very supervised program over a period of three months, which made substantial improvements in patients' ability to function. So I think working with someone with regards to exercise, and particularly someone who's trained in kind of dysautonomia and hypermobility, because a lot of patients with hypermobility and Ehlers-Danlos also get POTS, a person who's experienced with this is a really good thing. I hope you found these lifestyle modifications useful. I'd love to hear what you think. Thank you once again for listening and uh, I'm so grateful for all the kind words. Uh, thank you.